We are in Acts chapter 6, and so if you want to turn to Acts chapter 6, we're going to go through it verse by verse. We continue this study in Acts, um, and, and the theme for it is called Communities of Transformation. We believe that Acts is not something that we study as a historical document, but really it's something that we look at as a, as a way to see what a, a community of transformation that early church was. As the Spirit of the living God was poured out upon them, they began to transform, and they began to transform the culture around them. And so as we're going through Acts, we're watching this progression happen as this as this takes place and it's not all perfect it's not all beautiful it's not all hemmed up some of it is pretty messy but that's why it's fun to look at acts and to study it and to understand historically contextually what is going on with this group of people and what can we learn from it because we are not so removed from them but we are partnered with them. So what God was doing in Acts, he's continuing to do in Medford, Oregon. What he was doing in that community, he's doing in this community and communities of faith around us. And what he's doing in this community of faith, he's doing in your home groups and the groups that you gather with in different ways. As we open up our lives to the move of the spirit of God, he cannot help but pour out upon us and then pour through us to reach those who need to know Jesus. And so we get to say yes to that. We're saying yes to that in everything that we do. And that's what this group of people in Acts was doing. So there's a lot that we can learn from them. And then there's some stuff that we want not, we don't want to learn from them. We want to learn as they do it. We go, oh, look, that was great. Look what you did. And then we go, that's probably what we shouldn't do. And then we learn from that as well. And so that's the fun of studying the, the book of Acts is it's not, it's not like a handbook on church doctrine. It's really just a story. And it can be the ups and downs and the journey of people. It's fancy the ups and downs and the journey of people who are surrendering their life to Jesus. And so join me in Acts chapter six. As you guys remember, as we've looked at this in Acts two, the, the early church was, was 100, about 120 people were waiting on the promise that Jesus gave them of the spirit of God falling upon them. And in Acts chapter two, you see that taking place. And it was during a festival uh, called the Pentecost. And so there were people gathering from all the different nations and regions to come into Jerusalem to celebrate P Pentecost. And as they celebrated Pentecost, there was a group of people in an upper room, kind of downtown, and, and God's spirit fell on them. And they started making a racket and people came around and were like, look at all these drunk people, what are they doing? And Peter, one of the people who were in that, was in that room, he stood forward and he began to proclaim the truth of the message of Jesus. And he began to express to people that Jesus was in fact the promised Messiah that is in Judaism, which they all adhered to, they were waiting for this Messiah that had been prophesied and prophesied. And they, he made this beautiful plea to people, to say Jesus was the Messiah. And they were like, awesome. Um, and he's like, and then we killed him. And they're like, oh, that's bad. What should we do? And he was like, repent for killing Jesus, be baptized, and you too can receive the spirit of God and we will move into a different religion. Now he didn't say it quite that succinctly as far as moving into a different religion, but that is in fact what happened is that they departed from Judaism and they began a different sect of Judaism and it was called followers of Jesus, learners of Jesus in Christianity in that way. And so this group of people began to follow Jesus and it says in Acts 2, it says again in Acts 4, that as they came together, that they were together in every way, they sold all of their possessions they gave away what they had and they gave it to the early church leaders to be able to take care of people who were renouncing their way of life. They were renouncing their reputation. They were renouncing in some ways, ways that they were making income. And so together they were selling all of this so that they could continue to function in following Jesus and telling people about Jesus. If you remember Matthew 24, Jesus's message was pretty clear to them that the time was very short. So it made sense that they would be selling their houses and not holding on to their reputation and any of that because Jesus said within this generation, all of this is going to be gone. Okay. So they're thinking this time is very short. They were correct. This time is very short. So they begin to live in that sort of unity and that sort of generosity. And that becomes the bedrock for Acts in the book of Acts. And then we come to Acts chapter six. And we see this unity of communities of transformation. They were together in every way. And then in Acts 6, 1, it says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, so this is the church was growing. And in, as Kim taught us in Acts chapter 5, or talked about in Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel had stood up. They had been brought before the, uh, Peter and John had been brought for this, before the Sanhedrin. They had been broken out of jail by an angel. 
and they had been told, hey, don't preach about Jesus anymore. What were they preaching about Jesus? If you look back in Acts chapter five, they were preaching about Jesus and they say, these guys, this is the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, they're gathered together and they're going, these guys are intent on blaming us for Jesus's death. Now, mind you that before Pilate, these are the same people that when Pilate said, I see nothing wrong with what Jesus has done, I don't want to turn him over to you. And they say, may his blood be on us and our children. These are the people who said that. And now they're standing before each other going, these two guys are so intent on blaming us for Jesus' death. They're like, yes, you were right there saying, we'll receive responsibility for Jesus' death. And so what the early church was preaching was exactly what had taken place. And so they were just telling the story over and over and over of what had taken place and how Jesus had died, who had killed Jesus, and why Jesus was resurrected and the new life that was being given out in Jesus the Messiah. And so as they're preaching this, they stand before the Sanhedrin and they go, we're gonna persecute them, we're gonna beat them, we're gonna say you can't preach anymore. And Gamaliel, one of the leaders of that, of that movement said, hey, let's let them have their day. And he says, if this is from God, it will continue to flourish. And we, if we oppose them, all we're doing is opposing God. But if it's not from God, then it's gonna just peter out. <laughs> that was a long setup for that joke, huh? Yeah. My whole messages are just setups for lame jokes. You know? um, it, just, it just dawned on me there was a correlation there. It probably is not entomologically correct. Um, so this is the, the, the disciples were increasing and then it says this, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked and neglected in the daily distribution of food. So we went from this amazing unity, everybody's selling everything, nobody has anything of their own, to now that money is involved. This fly is on my face. You guys can't see it, can you? You're like, what is he freaking out about? There's a fly that keeps landing on my face. So this community of people has gone from that degree of unity to now there is finances involved. And there is, we have given the most because these people have come from other regions and we are living here, we've sold our houses and they've come from somewhere else and we should take care of, therefore, since we gave the most, we should get taken care of first. There's no generosity in that, I know, but this is the sort of division that they're now dealing with in Acts 2 and in Acts 4. And so let me give you a little bit of cultural or contextual background on this historically. So the Hellenistic Jews, these are foreign-born Jews who had adopted the Greek language and culture. Okay? Imagine that with me. Stay with me. Um, they'd lived most of their lives outside of Jerusalem and maybe even Judea. And they had very likely come to Jerusalem during the Pentecost festival, heard about Jesus and decided to stay there and live in that region and, and become a part of this new sect of Judaism called Christianity or the, or the way of Jesus. And so... They wouldn't have had as much property to sell like many of the local followers of Jesus would. And so then you have your Hebraic Jews, and this refers to Jews who have not widely adopted Greek language or culture. They have chosen to stay within their familiar culture. And so they, they primarily spoke Aramaic and they remained fundamentally Jewish in their lifestyle. They did not want to take on the customs and the culture of the Roman government that was, that was over them. And so some Jews had chosen to, to take on the culture around them and some had not. But then they all came to Jesus and it appears that in coming to Jesus that they brought some of that division with them. And so that brings us to, to uh, moving through Acts chapter six. So the early church was suddenly up against this division, this suspicion, grumbling against one another, fear of one another. And the Hebraic Jews of Jerusalem were probably more than a little bit suspicious of the Christians, these Christians from outside of their familiar and outside of their norm. These Christians now that they had probably lived in judgment of previously, they are now being thrown into community with. And we see this all the time is that people come to Jesus from different backgrounds and different viewpoints and different ways of life and we come to Jesus and before we're in Jesus it's easy for us to judge one another but then we come to Jesus and we're like oh hey brother 
sister, how's it going, right? But really, we still have this suspicion, this division, this fear of other because of different viewpoints. And they're experiencing this in the early church. They didn't act like them, talk like them. They had different views of interacting with the government or interacting with culture. Anybody recognize this and have some familiarity of what today looks like? It's the same stuff that we are constantly up against. And so because of that, mistrust came and discrimination began to arise and it was causing this problem that was then brought before the apostles, the leaders of the early church. And I, and I don't wanna sugarcoat this. I don't wanna brush by this. I get to teach for the next several weeks, so there is no reason to rush through the book or the, the book of Acts, as you may have noticed. We'll be done in 2023. But I don't wanna sugarcoat this because I think it's important for us and where we are right now as a church, where we are as a culture. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, widows often could not take care of themselves and meet their immediate needs unless they were supported by their family. If their family could not support them, they were at the mercy of the church. And so the church built, the Ju Judaism built the temple and the priests, they built a way for widows to be able to be cared for. But when those widows came to Jesus and became followers of the way, that temple support system was taken away from them. And now they were reliant upon the early church, those leaders and the, the different stories we've seen already throughout Acts of the generosity of others to be able to be sustained. And so if, if what is happening in the early church is true, that there was a group of believers that were overlooking fellow believers who were in need and they were overlooking them because of a cultural difference, an ethnic difference, a racial difference, it reveals a serious and highly problematic tension that was birthing within the church, was growing within the church, and it was going to continue to be a problem. It's already a problem because you've got two different sects of Judaism and the Hellenistic and Hebraic Jews coming together. It's gonna to be a greater problem when the gospel begins to be spread to the Gentiles. And Paul, God bless him, goes out there and just starts telling about Jesus to everybody. And then they're joining us in all of this racial tension, all of this, these division points are festering in the heart of the church, of the early church, and God is trying to root them out. And so we have this moment where we don't want to just blow by this because widows and people who were in need were reliant upon the church. And we're not simply talking about a handout. In some cases, we're talking about livelihood and life and death. And to say, oh, I'm gonna withhold from you because you're different than me. And I'm gonna give extra and make sure that those who are like me are cared for. And I'm gonna build a system that ensures that those who are most like me are cared for and those who aren't like me get second handouts or get overlooked. If that's the reality of the early church, imagine if that continues to grow, what it would look like in 2021 if God didn't deal with it, if we didn't deal with it, it might still exist. And I believe in many, 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 many ways, it absolutely does. But we see an early church who is dealing with this and confronting this much as we still are in humanity. Everybody tracking with me? Woo, okay, this is fun. Okay, so. Verse two. I love this, supernatural solutions. Major problems create opportunities for supernatural solutions if we're willing to move into the, to the wisdom of God. And so the 12, gathered and the, or the 12 gathered all the church together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So wait a minute. The problem is, is, this, is this difference within culture is creating a divide and people are taking care of some and not taking care of others. And they're saying, uh, we can't handle all of this. And their wisdom is as leaders often is to take on everything and go, oh, another, bring me another problem. Bring me another problem. Bring me another problem. And I will take care of it. I will take care of it. I will take care of it. And the trickle down of leaders who take on too much and live in too much and often carry too much authority, is that things do not get solved at a level where people's lives need to be touched because they're the bottleneck to solutions that are all around them. And thankfully, the disciples didn't 
become that bottleneck. They recognized a solution that I think is radical and something that we still should be doing today. So they aren't minimizing, one thing I wanna say, they aren't minimizing serving. They had the example of Jesus and Jesus' example of leadership was what? Washing feet. And what Jesus, when he restored Peter and sat with Peter, what did he tell Peter to do? Feed my sheep. So I don't think that the disciples, the apostles, the leaders of the early church are saying, we're too good to serve because Jesus' model was serving. We're never more like Jesus than when we're serving others and the least of these, right? And so that's Jesus' mantra and that's what he taught them. They haven't already grown too important to serve. And if they have, then they've totally missed it. What I think is happening here is that they are learning a lesson to step away from the busyness of ministry to focus on the imperative that Jesus gave them. And what was the imperative? The imperative was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The imperative was when my spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be my witnesses. And that's what they were assigned and commissioned to do. And if they're trying to do everything, then nothing will get done. And so if their true responsibility was to teach that message, they had to make a choice in this moment to empower others to see solutions, supernatural solutions to this problem that was going on within the church. And I'm not talking about them just focusing on Bible studies. So often we say, and I gotta teach the word. And we're like, oh cool, they're gonna have more Bible studies. No, they are literally fulfilling Acts 1.8, that we would be filled with the spirit, that we would be a demonstration of his power and that we would tell people over and over and over about Jesus. Why? Because they're the ones that walked with Jesus. They're not hosting Bible studies. The word became flesh. They were teaching Jesus and being incarnate carriers of Christ and his power and his kingdom, inviting people into it. And they were seeing people coming to know Jesus and that's what they were to continue to do. And so it came to them as a form of a solution. Verse three, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And that's preaching the good news. And this proposal pleased the whole group. So now they step back into unity. They take all of the group and they say, here is our solution. We are going to take, we are gonna step back because what's happening under our leadership is that some are being cared for and some are not. And we recognize that as a problem and as a solution, instead of us saying an edict from the top that says everybody gets the same amount of food or us trying to be the solution, we are going to delegate to those who can make the greatest impact. And so that's what they did. And this pleased the whole group. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicomor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And so it's, as I said, it's significant that the entire church is single-minded again in this solution. The leaders have brought them together to see a solution to this disunity between cultural factions. And so notice this as the solution. Each one of these seven, if you study this, each one of these seven, seven had Greek names. And so these would have been Hellenist Jews. So this was the group that was underrepresented. This is the group that was being underserved. And instead of putting someone that would say, oh, I don't know, I don't know if you're experienced, that's not what I've experienced, my story is different than your story, and continue to live as if that's the true reality, they brought people who have it, walked it and experienced it, and they empowered them as leaders and brought them to the table and said, how do we solve this? How do we make an impact on this problem that's going on? We're not gonna simply sit from our perspective and dole out solutions. We wanna bring people who are walking this out and can be leaders and are anointed to be able to bring solutions and be representatives of people who need to be cared for. What could have divided them became an opportunity for them to come together. And the leaders that were empowered over this under, underserved or underrepresented people, that was the solution. The change was led from within. It wasn't that top-down mandate, everybody gets this much food. It was true change <clears throat> excuse me, it was true change and it came through people and leaders within the community who were empowered to see a difference being made. So my question, I think I'm gonna just pause right there at verse five. We'll pick it up next week at verse six. And I wanna ask you guys a question. 
Can a church model health and God's solution where culture is struggling with racial, ethnic, national, cultural, or political division? Can a church do that? Because I think that's what's needed and I think that's what we saw take place in this story is that where culture would struggle to find a solution and in their grappling and in their confusion and in their anger or their frustration, their solutions, while valuable and valid, may not quite capture the full heart of restoration and reconciliation that God has. And so what if in this situation, the leaders were able to grab onto something that became a model for the culture around them. Instead of us looking to culture for our cues, what if as a church and as a community, we begin to walk in the way that God is leading us in reconciliation, in connection, in moving uh, these, these conversations forward in a powerful way that really actually transforms and brings about health and better conversations in our culture around us, instead of us just hiding out and hoping that something's changing. We are to be the people of God, filled with the Spirit. We are to be the catalyst for change. And we are to be the ones that get a hold of the Father's heart, see the ways that we can walk this out in our community of a few hundred people. And if it works in our community of a few hundred people, then we have something that we can take to the people around us and say, this is God's heart for this. But if it's not happening here, how do we bring something to the culture around us? that carries hope and carries Jesus. And so my question again is this, can a church model health and God's solutions where culture is struggling to find solutions? And I believe we absolutely can. But finding those solutions is so much harder than just taking care of our own and finding a group of people who all think and talk and believe the same way that we do. In the same vein that that early church and those groups were doing, we can find solutions, but it's easier not to. Let's just find people who think the way we think, who talk the way we talk, who believe the way that we believe, and let's create a group of people who have this kind of agreement. The problem is, is I haven't just described a spirit-filled, thriving community or a church. I've described a cult. And so my question again, can we be mature enough in our faith that we gather around Jesus in such a radical way that we can actually commune with people who have different viewpoints than us, have different perspectives than us, who come from different backgrounds than us, who carry a different, uh, have walked out of a different season than us and look different than us. And I say this, in all sincerity, coming out of the hardest season that I've ever experienced as a leader, is that you are so loved and so served and that we fight to hold space for a powerful community. But we've also seen so many people walk away from this community over the last 18 months because they didn't like a particular way that we said this thing, did this thing, Meeting outside, oh, you're meeting out. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna start going through this because then it just sounds like I'm bitter. <laughs> I'm not bitter, I'm hurt. Because I believe that we can be a community who doesn't divide over political stuff. I believe that we can be a community who doesn't divide over who you voted for or who you voted for or what your, your belief is on this or your belief is on that. But if that is the primary way that we view the world, then it is easy for us to divide. But if the way that we view one another is through Christ and through his spirit, that we no longer view each other in the flesh, but we view each other through the spirit, what can happen is that we can have a space where we can disagree without having to divide. Yeah. I want us to be a church where you can come up to me after church and go, Ryan, you're an idiot. because you made people wear masks. And I can be like, oh, thank God for telling me that, that you think I'm an idiot. <laughs> now you don't have to leave. You can just say, I think you're an idiot and you're wrong. And I'll say, great, I love you, you love me. Let's just keep going forward together because there's more important things at hand. Yeah, 
And the more important thing is what Jesus was doing in the early church. There's more important things than what God's doing in our region, in Medford, in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your kids, in this context, in this city. There's bigger things that God is doing. When we divide over small things, we lose opportunity to carry a momentum that can truly affect the world around us. Do we believe that we can gather together with people who see things, believe things differently. Is there a place for you if you voted for Biden, you voted for Trump, you voted for McMullen, you voted for Bernie? Is that, can we all just, just go like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Now let's come together and let's move forward. And if there's hard conversations that need to be had in that, then let's have those hard conversations. What if we, what if we fought for a relationship instead of fighting against each other? What if we wrestled with hard things instead of ejecting as soon as we come across somebody who doesn't view the world exactly the same way that we do? That's what supernatural community becomes. That's what it grows off of, is our willingness to engage and come to the word and say, what is Jesus telling us to do? So here's what I want to do as we end, and, and forgive me if that felt a little preachy or whatever, but it's just, there's going to be a lot of processing in my life of this last season. And I know there's going to be a lot of processing in your life in this last season. But what we want, as I've said this before, is Jesus is reforming us after a hard season. And in that reforming, if we choose to come together around Jesus and not come together around anything else, everything else we can come together around is secondary to Jesus. And if we're reformed around Jesus, it gives us a chance to deal with those secondary issues that are so important, but we're doing it from that place of saying Jesus is central to our relationships, our friendships, our community. So as we close, so that being said, I'm not trying to, to whine and complain. It's just been a tough thing to watch. Um, but what we want is as we're being reformed out of this is to simply invite us to a renewed commitment to simply loving Jesus and loving people, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and always following Jesus' command to love our enemies. And to listen to Holy Spirit when we come to that conversation about who is our enemy, that we would recognize that we are not to make enemies out of people who are to be allies and brothers and sisters along this difficult road with us. If our life gets so narrow that we're dividing, 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 we can end up in a situation like they had in the early church. But what we should be doing is saying, Holy Spirit, how are you gonna show us to walk forward in this? What is your pathway forward? And who needs to be at the table? Whose voice needs to be empowered? What does leadership look like so that it's not all on Kate and I? That we would say, we want to give this away to a group of people empowered, mature, and in the fullness of God. That they would be able to work through their differences, struggle well together, wrestle with differences, fight for relationship, fight for each other, pour out the fullness of God in everything that they do, and believe the best about one another. That's what we want to see. And that doesn't start, just starts at the top. No, that starts with all of us. And so would you join me in standing up this morning? Woo! Okay, 11.29, hold on, hold on. This is what I wanna do. I just want you to intercede with me for unity in this house. And we can't yell at the culture for unity unless we're willing to walk out that difficult road here. And so as I had you this morning just moving around a little bit and looking into people's eyes and seeing people, so I want you to know that in this room are a hundred different perspectives on what America means. A hundred different experiences of what growing up in America was like. A hundred different perspectives of what we should be doing politically. A hundred different perspectives of what we should be doing with our taxes. A hundred different differences. A hundred different differences. Just go with it. Of how we should have handled this as a church community. Of what Kate and I should have done. Of whether we should be meeting under a tent of whether we sing the right songs or don't say Jesus enough. Whatever it is, there's people all around you who view so many parts of life differently than you do. And this is all I ask this morning as we close. 
is that you would just take one minute and look around at different people and just acknowledge people, look them in the eyes. And in your heart, just pray for unity. You don't even have to pray out loud. Just look at people and pray for unity in your heart. It starts in your heart to say, I see you. Jesus is greater than anything that would divide us. Just look around, open eyes. Our time is spent this morning on something so worthwhile if it is simply looking in other people's eyes and saying, we may disagree on a whole bunch of secondary things, but on the reality of Jesus, we are together. And if we're together in that, then we can find solutions and we can walk in unity that'll change this city. So Jesus, we thank you for these lives and these people. In the early church, you fought for unity with them. You gave them strategies and solutions that I believe were supernatural in wisdom to be able to break down that division that so often wanted to visit their movement. And we pray this morning for this group, representative of a larger group who call Living Waters home, representative of an expanded group who are connected with Living Waters, representative of even a larger group we just call the church in this valley, this city. And we ask God for a fresh awakening of unity. We repent, first of all, God, of our own hearts and lives where we have built up walls, where we have brought judgment, where we have shut down, where we have retracted, where we have partnered with a spirit of mockery, we've partnered with a spirit of pride, we've partnered with a spirit of division. We repent of that, Jesus, and we say, start with me. If I've built a wall around my heart, my eyes, or my life, take me to that place before that sets, and let me begin to dismantle it today with you. And we will begin. We will do the work, God, individually, and then we will do the work as a community to break down walls that we've built around each other, or between each other. And we ask, God, that you would take that simple offering and you would pour your spirit afresh upon us. That whatever happens, that if this is the this is the winnowing, this is the shrinking, this is the whatever it is that as we come out of this as a people of living waters, that we would come out of this together like we've never been before and our hearts would be in one accord like that early church that we would be together in everything that we do. And when we go from this place, we will look back and we will mark it as that moment when we said, God, we chose to be with each other no matter what because that's what Jesus' heart is. And then everything that came out of it, it would be because of that unity around you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Love you guys.